Hello to everybody um, and thank you for joining us today. We have a panel that is quite incredible. I don't remember this from any global investigative conference before and I've been to several of them. We have um, five panelists from a huge part, a huge swath of the globe um, today um, from Ukraine, Sudan, Moscow, Liberia and Lebanon. Um, they all, like many investigative journalists, are grappling with the same kind of issues, corruption at the highest level of the, of the governments in their countries. And today they're going to describe how they revealed um, what we call high crimes and misdemeanors, um, embezzlement, um, human rights abuses, in countries where this is far from easy to do. Um, I'm going to start off um, by presenting Anna Babinec. Um, forgive me if I mispronounced your last name, Anna, um, who will join us from Kiev, Ukraine. Um, she is um, a part of uh, the investigative investigative organization there, and again, I'm going to mispronounce the name, Slitsivu, um, and um, we'll talk about how she revealed the embezzlement of money, of assets by Ukrainian judges to the Constitutional Court. Anna, I ask you please to unmute yourself um, as you begin your presentation. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for introduction. I'm very happy to talk. Uh, we still live in, in online world. I I hope next year or next few years we will we will have big conferences. But now we have what we have. Um, so I'll talk about investigation of Ukrainian judges. Now we see that uh, Ukrainian uh, judge system is one of the most corrupted uh, structure, if not structure like. Uh, judges are well, one of the most corrupted uh, people if we talk about uh, officials in Ukraine. Uh, first few uh, few words about uh, about me, about organizations I represent here. Uh, Slits 24, uh, it's an investigative center based in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, we established in 2012. So uh, almost 10 years we work as investigators in Ukraine. So we work we talk about high corruption, we uh, investigate uh, big crimes, we investigate judges as well. Uh, OCCRP, it's Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. I think that you know this organization. This is a big network based in Sarajevo, Bosnia. So uh, we work with OCCRP as local centers list when uh, And we usually work at uh, big international projects like Pandora Papers, Paradise Papers, and others. Uh, so let's talk about judges and talk about our work because I think that maybe 30 or 40 percent of our work is uh, um, investigation in this area, cards, judges. Uh, so our last big investigation, it was we released a story about Ukrainian cards. Um, uh, it was the story about uh, hidden negotiation and appointments in uh, constitutional card, but for um, almost every our video story, big video story, we publish documentaries, we publish uh, special reports, uh, we organize special events for representing our work, and this time in September, two months ago, it was warm in Kiev, we released our documentary on the wall of constitutional card. You can see in this picture, this constitutional card of Ukraine, and we decided to make this kind of performance because when we publish something in Ukraine, judges ignore us, they almost don't do anything, and we just wanted to show our investigation, our story on the wall. It's absolutely legal in Ukraine, of course, people from police came and asked what we're doing there, uh, so they tried to uh, I can say that they didn't want, they tried to stop this, but they were not happy with that. It was many people who watched that, uh, and it was our attempt to, uh, to take in attention of the people and judges who work there. It was already evening. So it was the story 
uh, about uh, hidden negotiation and appointments, as I mentioned, very important judges, constitutional court uh, by powerful people linked to Ukrainian president. And for this story, we obtained some records uh, of that negotiation uh, in the room of the head of court. Uh, and uh, when we start to investigate who that people who talk what exactly happened, uh, we figure out that plans of people around the current president had their plan about appointment and constitutional court and they reached their plans. Uh, previously, one year ago, we published two stories, two serious documentary based on the same records I already mentioned uh, from the office uh, very powerful Ukrainian judge. I will not mention names because it's a big international conference and I don't think that you, uh, you need names of Ukrainian judges, but if you want any details, you can find on our social networks or you can text me in the end, I'll give my contacts. Uh, so we showed that as the head of uh, one of Ukrainian cards, very powerful card, uh, use, uh, he and his colleagues, they used uh, their position for their private purposes. Um, one of the judge under investigation now, but uh, they still work and they're still powerful. Uh, and I can say that our story, because when we published it two years ago, these two, uh, two investigations, like two series of one story, it was like big thing in Ukraine, everyone talks about that, but um, the guys ahead of the card still work. So after we publish big stories, it's always important and always interesting what the judges do after we publish stories about them. Of course, we want them to be uh, punished, to be hired because, um, uh, to be fired because of their, if they do something illegal and we found a lot of illegal stuff. But in Ukraine, things uh, work a little bit in a different way. So, uh, the card I mentioned after uh, our documentary uh, bought special anti-surveillance equipment for public money. So because as I mentioned, uh, two big stories we published for last year uh, were based on records from the office, from the room of uh, the head of card. And then when they realized that, that uh, records, their talks can be published, uh, they just bought special equipment for not uh, for 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 things that it will not happen in the future anymore. Uh, and another thing which happened, I'll talk about that story. One of judge we found that uh, later uh, illegally requested phone records of our journalist for understanding uh, who is her source. Um, this is it was the story about. As a, as a story after the judge asked about uh, uh, phone records of our journalists, it was a story about birthday party of one powerful judge. Uh, we knew in what place he will celebrate that, and we just uh, came there and filmed his guest. I mean, we were working outside, and we just wanted to show how powerful people came to this judge with their presence, with all the things. We were outside, of course, police came to our car. They asked about that park, you know, the things that always happen when we, um, uh, when we film something not comfortable for uh, officials. And uh, after we showed the story, who came to the birthday of this powerful judge, this judge, Evgeny Ablov, uh, we found letters that he asked about uh, phone records of our journalists. He wanted to know who gave our journalist the place of celebrating. So that very short uh, and uh, like some reaction of our stories of our investigation. Uh, and always when we film something or investigate something against judges, we always have a lot of obstacles, police come, all the things I mentioned. Um, another story, uh, we published video about drunk judge. We got from our sources video. Uh, and we proved that uh, the judge was drunk um, when he was driving. It's absolutely not acceptable in Ukraine. You even can't have a glass of wine or beer. It's like zero. 
uh, for Ukraine. So the, the judge was drunk, it was visible on the video, and we published one story, second story, but in the end, the colleague of the judge who made decision about that case, she didn't find proofs that the guy was drunk and he still work, everything is good with him. Uh, so I'm trying to be, I know that there are a lot of uh, story, a lot of speakers uh, from around the world and they want to tell about their stories, about their work. So it's just short, very short introduction what we do in Ukraine, how we try to find something uh, and to discover something interesting and important about judges and how it usually uh, finish. Uh, so uh, uh, if shortly saying that uh, Ukrainian judges think the journalists, uh, they're en en enemies and uh, we understand that it's not easy because as I mentioned, usually when we start doing something about judges, some people come, police come, someone call us. So it's not easy, but we still think that it's very important uh, to do this and show real life of judges and uh, reforming of Ukrainian cards. Now one of the biggest problem in Ukraine and there are um, a lot of top politician European structures really care about uh, this as this part of life. And we are as journalists, we uh, try to, we try to do for making this process uh, faster, because it's really, it things which every person in Ukraine feels that Ukrainian judge is corrupted, not professional, and think about their private interest. Uh, so thank you, this is my contact. If you want to ask a question or cooperate or know more about judges, I will be happy to, um, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, so, Yes, I, I see there are a lot of other speakers who want to talk about their work and I'm waiting for listen from them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anna. Um, I just um, want to please remind the speakers that there is a lot of you. Um, I am actually going to interrupt you after like five minutes and let you know you have just a couple of more minutes to speak. Um, you really don't need to go through the whole presentation. Everything is on the tip sheet um, site within GIJN, um, which I urge everybody to look at. Um, I want to cross the world or maybe go southeast um, from where Anna was and introduce Fateh Al-Rahman Al-Hamdani, who is in Sudan. Um, he is going to be speaking in Arabic. Those who would like to um, uh, switch to the English, please click on the globe icon and um, click on English. Um, uh, Fateh is um, an investigative journalist in Khartoum. Um, he has come to us amid um, an incredible upheaval there at the moment. He and he directed an incredible documentary for the BBC Arabic, um, which got a lot of attention, center, centering on the Khalwas, the religious schools there, and the abuses of students within them. Fatih, I'll hand it over to you. Global Investigative Journalism Conference. تحقيق الخلاوي في البدء هي عبارة عن مدارس إسلامية تقوم بتعليم الأطفال القرآن الكريم وهي منتشرة في السودان في جميع أنحاء السودان وليس هناك إحصائية دقيقة لعدد هذه المدارس ولكن يقارب نحو ثلاثين ألف مدرسة تقوم هذه المدارس في الأساس على الدعم الدولة وبعض الأشخاص الذين يقدمون الأموال كدعم لها وإضافة إلى عمل آخر هي دعم الدولة في الحشود السياسية والكتابات الجماهيرية 
لذلك لديها ارتباط مع الدولة وحماية كاملة لزمن طويل كان الجميع يعتقد أن هذه المدارس فقط تقوم بتعليم القرآن بطرق معروفة لدى الجميع ولكن في الآونة الأخيرة ظهرت بعض الإشكاليات بأن تقوم هذه المدارس بممارسات فيها انتهاكات للأطفال من تقييد ومن ضرب بس من ضرب بالصياد والتقييد بالسلاسل إضافة إلى حتى الاختصاب جاءت الفكرة بعدما انتشر بعد ال بعد الأحاديث حول أن هنالك خلاوي تقوم بتقييد الأطفال وضربهم وعندما تحدثت مع مجموعة من الأشخاص المقربين عن صحة هذا الأمر هل هنالك خلاوي تقوم بمثل هذه الانتهاكات وجدت إنه أن الجميع في السودان يقدس هذه المدارس ويرفض تماما فكرة أن تكون بداخل هذه المدارس أي انتهاكات للأطفال قمت بزيارة إحدى الخلاوي للتأكد من صحة هذه المعلومة ولحساسية المدارس ذات نفسها اجتماعيا وثقافيا وسياسيا في السودان ذهبت متخفيا إلى إحدى الخلاوي وتأكدت أن هنالك أطفال مقيدون بدأت رحلة كيف نوثق هذه الانتهاكات داخل هذه المدارس خاصة وأن هذه المدارس محصنة تحصين عالي جدا من قبل الشيوخ الذين يديرونها ومن الساهل جدا أن يتم تسليمك إلى السلطات خاصة في ذاك الوقت هنالك سلطة ديكتاتورية تشكل غطاء وحماية لهذه المدارس وبحكم أنه لدي معرفة سابقة لأنني درست في هذه المدارس من قبل وجدت استراتيجية استراتيجية تمكنني من الدخول إلى هذه المدارس بعد توفر معلومات مهمة عن هذه المدارس وأماكن تواجدها خاصة التي تمارس هذه الانتهاكات دخلت متخفيا طريق الكاميرا السرية وكان ليس من السهل أن تدخل فاخترت بعض الأوقات أوقات زيارة بعض الأشخاص إلى الخلاوي أو إلى هذه المدارس وقمت بالدخول وجدت أن هنالك أطفال مقيدين بسلاسل وهنالك أطفال يتم ضربهم بصورة وحشية بالإضافة إلى حالات من الأمراض العضوية وإنعدام الغذاء الكافي لهؤلاء الأطفال وغياب الرعاية التامة للدولة بصورة كبيرة واجهت صعوبة في عدد من الخلاوي لأنهم كانوا يعتقدوا إنه أنني غير مرغوب فيه خاصة وأنهم يقومون بإغلاق هذه المدرسة من الداخل ولا يسمحون لأحد بالدخول إلا إذا تأكدوا من هويته وتأكدوا من أنه لا يفعل شيئا أو يقوم بعملية التصوير وكذا النقطة الثانية اتبعنا بعض الإجراءات في أننا حتى نقوم بتصوير السري كان يجب علينا أن نقوم بزيارة ميدانية لكل خلوة نحن تأكدنا من أنها أو وصلتنا معلومات من أنها تقوم بتقييد الأطفال بعدها بدأت هنالك بعض المشاكل التي تحدث من الأطفال ذات نفسهم الضحايا عندما أتحدث مع بعض من الأطفال حول المشاكل التي يعانونه داخل الخلوة وجدت أن هناك أشخاص يتتبعون خطواتي أينما أذهب ويأتوا ويسأل الأطفال عن ماذا قلت لهم ويقومون بمعاقبتهم بصورة أو بأخرى بعدها قمنا بمقابلة المسؤولين عن هذه المدارس للتأكد من ماذا يحدث تفاجأنا بأن هذه المدارس وهذا العدد الكبير من المدارس والأطفال في هذه الخلاوي 
لا تتبع لأي جهة رسمية في الدولة كل جهة رسمية في الدولة تقول أنها غير مسؤولة من هذه المدارس وأن هذه المدارس هي تتبع لجهة أخرى ونذهب إلى الجهة الأخرى تقول لا أن هذه المدارس لا تتبع إلى هذه الجهة بعدها تواصلنا مع الجهات العدلية حول إذا كان هنالك أي تبعية أو أي قوانين مثلا تنظم عمل هذه المدارس وجدنا أن ليس هنالك أي قوانين ومن السهل للشخص في السودان أن يفتح خلوة أسرع من أن يفتح مدرسة أو روضة للأطفال بالنسبة للحالات الموجودة اللي هو محمد نادر وإسماعيل في التحقيق هذه الخلوة لديها سجن كبير وسجن انفرادي داخل هذه السجن الكبير وهنالك أشخاص أطفال في أعمار الخامسة والسادسة مزلونين داخل هذه الخلوة ويقومون يقومون بتعذيبهم وضربهم ومنعهم من الطعام والشراب إلى أن وقعت حادثة كبيرة لمحمد نادر وإسماعيل حيث تم ضربهم وتقييدهم لأنهم أرادوا الفرار من هذه المدرسة إلى منازلهم وسجنهم لمدة سبع أيام دون طعام أو ماء مما جعل حالتهم تسوء بشكل فظيع واضطر الشخص المسؤول من الخلوة الاتصال بأسرتيهما وإخبارهم بأن أبنائهم مريضين بحمى وعليه أن يأتي ببعض الأدوية معه في يديه حتى يسعفه وعندما وصل وجد أن هنالك يعني حالة حالتهم يرثى لها أخذهم إلى المستشفى لم تأتي أي جهة رسمية للإثمنان على حالتهم أو أن تقوم بإجراءات قانونية حتى النيابة بدأت غير مكترثة لما حدث الخلاصة أنه إلى الآن ما زال وضع الأطفال في الخلاوي سيء والدولة ما زالت تتعامل بعدم التراس لهذا الموضوع وخاصة عدنا إلى الوراء في الأيام الماضية بانقلاب عسكري استخدم هؤلاء الأطفال في مسيرات للتأييد لأطفال هذه الخلاوي في مسيرات للتأييد وهذا مؤشر خطير في أنه يعني ما زال الأطفال بحاجة إلى حماية شكرا جزيلا Thank you very, very much, Fatih. Um, I, uh, please, I urge everybody to click on the tip sheet and to go to the YouTube um, link, which is there, which will take you to the BBC documentary. Very worth watching. Uh, I wanted to introduce next uh, Maxime Litavrin uh, from Moscow. Um, Maxime is um, the data services project director, if that's correct, at MediaZuna in Moscow, and um, is going to talk about how to basically turn these investigations into infographics and how they've managed to do that in Russia and the incredible impact of uh, what that does. Maxim, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I'm here presenting presenting the Media Zona data team. Uh, I won't talk about uh, I won't talk a lot about ourselves. Uh, I want to, um, to say that uh, we are told that we are doing not so bad. So today I'm gonna share some of our experience uh, about reporting repressions and uh, turning them into infographics. So uh, let me begin with a very very obvious thing. Uh, the states that torture their own citizens, the states that uh, repress uh, their own citizens, they obviously don't want you or anybody else to know something about that. So, uh, like it always do in uh, investigations, the first question you ask yourself is where to find information. And here on the screen is how we work. I believe that there are three main steps about finding information. Uh, the first one is about finding human sources, like sources, sources, the mysterious official human beings uh, that uh, give you the information and ask you to stay anonymous. And the second one is about non-human sources. It's about finding traces, finding related documents, maybe 
photos and all that stuff. And the third is about double checking your information. And I think I can give a tip about the third step. It sounds very, very simple, but I swear it works. When I need to find something hidden, I grab a pen, a paper, and create the who may know list. It's a list full of the job titles or the names of people that might possess the information I need. Uh, I write that down everything that comes to my head and then cross out the unreachable persons like the god or the president, uh, something like that. And then I'm trying to figure out how can I connect with uh, people who left. It really helps to systematize your findings. Uh, I won't stop on the part two because uh, uh, finding traces is a very country related, so I can tell only about Russia and maybe some Belarus. And obviously, I won't stop on the part three. It's here just for the protocol, always fact check. We all know that. So how it works, uh, I think everybody knows about the Belarus 2020 protests. There were a lot of police brutality on the streets. We saw the photos, uh, the videos. We wanted to report that to have the whole picture. And obviously, there was no single piece of official information. So we created the list that I mentioned, and there were two main directions. Uh, who may know? Of course, uh, the police itself. Uh, I don't mean just police, police, but also the investigators, the special services in Russia. We call that group of people Siloviki. And the second direction were medics, because injured uh, people in the street, they all obviously need medical treatment. So we, we reached the medics, uh, and they had only pieces of information like only for the, their hospital, and it's impossible to reach every hospital in the country. But they told us they, they should report all potential crime cases, like uh, traumas on the street is potential crime case. Crime case. Uh, they should report it to the investigative committee of the Belarus. And also we found that a lot of investigators were shocked by police brutality. And by this chain, we found a high rank whistleblower in the committee who gave us all the information. And this is what we've done. Uh, this is a story uh, a, a lot in, in the story that's a lot of luck, but I think is a great demonstration of this mechanism. And let's, uh, let's go to the next part. Uh, okay, you have all the information and you can actually create your story. Here's another tip. Before we start, we ask ourselves, what is our main product for now? If we believe that uh, our main product for now will be the text story, we create a quick and simple infographic like bar charts, timelines, linear graphs, and so on. They are easy and they are designed to follow up texts or maybe news. And if we believe that the story should be told interactively, if we believe that the infographics will be our main product, we never create something simple. We create unique features like interactive maps, like dummy crowds you've seen, uh, you've seen a second ago, and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have two sub teams. Uh, uh, it's, uh, no, yeah, we have uh, two sub teams, one for the quick stories and one for the features. We can make our feature for weeks and months, but during th this period, we still can drop two or three quick stories. And here is example of our quick story. It's the conviction timeline of one of the Russian political prisoner. The authorities lock him up into punishment cell almost for the whole his time in jail. And you can see this in this peak. This is follow up to our text. And here is an example of our feature. It's a screenshot of our infographics about Russian protesters jailed after the 2021 winter protests. On our side, it's totally clickable. It contains all the information about protests in Russian, in Russian cities, cities in 2021 and all the information about every single person jailed. Uh, and now I want to talk about uh, creating features. You can see our main steps on this slide, I want to give a tip about the first step, uh, the real life references. Let's see how it works. Uh, we believe that the best way to impress our reader is to show him infographics that can be associated with something he has seen before, which he has seen in his everyday life. But this process has a fine line, cross it, and you will look totally weird. Please don't make doodles or the bar charts out of a Coca-Cola Coca-Cola cans. <laughs> it's weird. 
this is an, an example of our Belarus 2020 infographics again. We had 1,400 injured people. We wanted to show damage done to every single person. So we asked ourselves, is there any body damage measure system? And we remembered about automobile crash tests and the color codification of the damage. And here it is. You can uh, see the uh, crash test dummy, the red, uh, red, green, yellow codification, and our infographics. Also, this is a kind of poetic statement because there are protesters on the one side and the brutal police force on the other side, and boom, crash, uh, the damage is done. And here is another example. I think everybody can tell what's going on on the left picture. Everybody had a PC with that laggy hard disk drive that sometimes needed defragmentation. And on the right side is the our defragmentation of anti-corruption foundation, foundation criminal case. We had 3,000 3, pages of documents. So we obviously can't describe every single one. So we bound them to the groups like the screenshots or the juridical acts and created this uh, to give our readers the whole picture of this case. And finally, I can give two general tips about creating infographics. Uh, the first tip, if you are really into data stories, if you consider, uh, if you consider creating your data project, uh, first thing you should do is hire a decent dev developer who will do all the front end job for you. For example, we use the D3 GS library for JavaScript. Yeah, the, we all know about Flourish, the data wrapper, it's a powerful tools, but uh, creating your own tools will give you more freedom and will give you your own style. Sometimes it's expensive and it takes time to build your own to tools, but uh, I believe that it's worth every penny. And uh, the second general tip uh, and also our greatest mistake, uh, when you build your very sexy project with the folding clickable super elements, don't forget about mobile users. These uh, innocent people with their tiny screens, they are not ready for your big maps and the ultimate interfaces and you probably make them suffer. For now, we build our projects mobile first. And here is a list of our tools, uh, all of them written down in the tip sheet I made for you. And I think this is it. So many thanks for watching and listening and my deep apologies to your beautiful ears. Thank you so much, Maxime, and right on time, I have to say. So um, um, I am going to cross uh, over to Betty Johnson and Bio now, who also in Africa, she's in Liberia. Betty, welcome. Um, and uh, Betty um, is going to talk about um, her investigation into um, uh, well, she will she will take it away, but uh, this is an investigation that involved mm -hmm. really the embezzlement of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars by government officials. Betty, over to you. Thank you again. Let me say that it is a privilege to be here today. So my screen is already shared and I'm going to be talking to you about how um, lawmakers, specifically legislators, um, refuse or um, did not name their assets on this part. And there's a law that and provides that they should um, declare their assets while and they are in office and before taking office. So my story is called The Happy Fuse and Happy Places, How Liberian Politicians and Officials Escape Accounting for Their Wealth. So um, these are my sources. So and this was, was specifically um, targeting lawmakers as i said and we were we were focused on um 15 incoming lawmakers because um there's a law that states that before you um become a lawmaker it is compulsory that you um declare your assets so and these are our sources we wish out uh to the elections commission the anti-corruption commission and the business registry 
to compare what and they have declared and what and has not and, and declared. So how was it done? We did an FOI to ensure that we will have um, a response from government. But then um, of the um, five FOIs that were done, we found out that um, none of them were answered. And it was like a back and forth thing that we're in as when you uh, request an FOI, they um, decide when they should answer. And if there is a complaint, they just don't care. Because the first thing their whole thought is, we will um, delay to see if she really wants this information. So an FOI was done and we also and search on um, Facebook, on social media, in Twitter, and we found out that what they have declared uh, um, um, to the Elections Commission is not what exactly um, they were showing on social media. So yes, the story, the entire story is, we compare what they have fought and what they are seeing with their families on social media. So the, so of the um, federal forms that we got from the um, Elections Commission, there were very few that we uh, look up to. And uh, this is Prince Moe, he's a former representative, but then he contested and as a senator, which of course he stays nine years as a senator. So this is what we found for him. And this is his house and this is his farm. And this is, is another um, produce from another farm. So if you look within his assets, you're going to find out that what he declared and these things are not stated within it. At the same time, we also reach out to um, Senator Chi, he was a, an incumbent and then he decided to recontest. And in his form, he did not place in these assets, which of course I had to travel to uh, verify if it's true that these assets are for him. This is um, Senator Yombly, she's one of the two females who are currently within the legislators. And what she also um, declare, and uh, these things are not within it. So um, for her, we establish these things from social media, Facebook, and we move on to, and um, we wish out to expert to share their views, which of course they said there's a need for Liberia to redo their um, assets declaration form. So this is the road that I travel on to verify some of these assets that I have shown. I have to wrap back. And because here you have a fan cast, moving cast sleep like on three to four days. So what are my, my recommendations? I would say that um, finding documents in Liberia is totally difficult. And it's probably not only Liberia, but uh, and there's one reason why why this is done, and this is because they want to see how persistent and how um consistent you will be. So so far so good. I would just want to say thanks for the opportunity, and thanks to all of those who were very passionate in um being with me, especially Sam Marcusin, Jeff, and Rana Mayo who was my editor. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Betty. That was very interesting. Um, I want to now introduce our last speaker on the panel. And maybe this is a moment to ask everybody to think about what questions you want to ask afterwards. We're going to have time for some discussion. And I certainly have a couple of questions. So I'm sure others do too. Um, Alia Ibrahim is in uh, Lebanon, and uh, she is a founding member, I believe, of Daraj, um, daraj.com. 
She's going to talk about her investigation into a man whose name is internationally well known as the world's longest serving central bank governor and the corruption she uncovered Alia. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be on this panel. Uh, I'll go as fast as possible. And I think I want to make just a few points. Uh, listening to my colleagues, and as Vivian mentioned at the beginning of this panel, really those chronic problems that we all share from uh, abuse of police uh, to uh, uh, compromised judiciary to lack of accountability uh, to uh, illicit wealth. I think it's the same story that we are all sharing in all our countries. Uh, I'll put the, our investigation into context Start from the, starting from this point. The reason why we decided, uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, we go back to 2019 when Lebanon uh, started entering into one of the biggest economic crises since the second half of the 19th century. Uh, more than 90% uh, of the value of the currency has been lost. A lot of people have lost all of their investments uh, that are locked in banks. Uh, so th this is in, it was in this context why we decided to focus on the central bank governor. He was somebody who has been in office for a very long time. Please go back to, to for the full context. I think it's on the slides, but uh, I'll go fast to make uh, the, the most important points. So there is this man who for over three decades have been above suspicions, even in, even in the context of the Lebanese political spectrum that is very divisive. This man has always been considered the most respectable above divisions like the security of Lebanon, the security of the economy. And suddenly overnight after, after October 19, he became the enemy number one of the population, regardless of their political affiliations. This has to do be, because of the fact that all of the Lebanese, over 1 million depositors, no longer had access to their funds. What was very interesting and uh, what was reported in the media was that uh, uh, it has been reported that over $6 billion have been taken out of the country at the same time when the central bank had imposed an unofficial capital control, meaning that while the, the people at large were, did not have access to their money, uh, the political establishment, the, 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 the politicians and their business associates were able to take their money out. It was a big story and it became even more suspicious when the central bank governor uh, launched an investigation. It was really ridiculous because it was the central bank investigating the central bank. So uh, the reason, um, um, as I mentioned, the man has a huge a reputation internationally as well as locally. He served for the longest time. And then uh, a, a, rep a report appeared that was leaked to the media that no one published because we could not source. But that report said that the, fight, that the personal wealth of the central bank governor uh, uh, exceeded $2 billion in European and international banks. Uh, the report was looked like it's written by a very serious uh, uh, investigators, but we could not source it, so we did not publish it. Everything changed when the report made, became public on social media. And the turning point was when the central bank governor himself commented on it. Uh, so kind of gave it a, a, a sort of credibility. And then he mentioned in, an, in a TV interview that his personal wealth before taking office was $23 million, which was analyzed by a lot of observers as, an, as a preemptive uh, step to, uh, to justify his wealth. Uh, what we did at this point, it became clear to us that we need to investigate the wealth of the governor uh, outside Lebanon. And this was super important because this guy has for 30 years been telling the Lebanese that the currency is safe, the, the, come bring your investments to Lebanon, while he himself has been taking his money out. This was at this point, we reached out to our colleagues at OCCRP and we requested their assistance to try to figure out uh, uh, what we could actually uh, uh, about this wealth. Uh, the investigation led us to, to, to we, we managed to publish two big stories and I'll go very quickly over the most important findings. We were able, we did not prove $2 billion in assets, but we were able to prove that the governor had in real assets across Europe, uh, a, a fortune that was 
uh, more than $100 million, it was very obvious that a lot of effort has been put so that nothing is traceable directly to his name. So there was a lot of companies that were created uh, and, and, and uh, uh, handling transactions to make sure that his name is not appearing uh, uh, directly. And another investigation found out that uh, uh, that there might be raised a red flag regarding uh, a conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis the 2016 financial engineering that he introduced in Lebanon that for many is one of the reasons that led to the financial collapse. And we figured in one of our investigations that one of the banks that benefited from the uh, financial engineering had actually a financial transaction uh, a personal financial transaction with the central bank governor. Uh, a few months later came the Pandora Papers, and through the Pandora Papers, you were able to prove that the central bank governor not only had his wealth being managed by other people, as he has always maintained, but he also was managing and directing another company that was also uh, uh, hidden, uh, which is a direct conflict the, or, or a direct violation of the credit and money law in Lebanon. Now, the bottom line is, despite all these red flags, despite all that is happening, uh, despite uh, our, our uh, investigations have been cited as, as, uh, uh, as at the root of some of the legal actions taken against the central bank government, there is now an investigation happening in Switzerland and another one in France, and there are talks about a uh, time like a, a judiciary process in the UK and in Belgium, despite all of this uh, noise around the persona of the central bank governor, and despite the fact that we are living in a country that is living in an incredibly difficult economic situation, the central bank governor continues to be in office. He continues to run the show financially in Lebanon. So uh, uh, we know that the, the publicity that he has been getting for three decades being like one of the superstars of finance in, in the world has turned around and he is now he now has internationally a very bad reputation. He has been arrested in Paris this summer for a few hours for taking in money that uh, in cash that that he did not uh, he did not uh, announce. Uh, so there is this discrepancy between what is happening at the level of the uh, international judiciary system and locally. There has been some like questionings, but nothing very serious. And he continues to be in office and he continues to lead the conversation with the IMF presently with the new government that is happening. Uh, bottom line, uh, um, we, we, we had to focus to decide on, like, because we have like a huge collection of corrupt uh, politicians in Lebanon. We decided to focus on someone who was the gatekeeper for the for the whole uh, uh, political establishment. And uh, what we have been seeing so far is that despite, uh, I mean, there is a great value in following up and in, in keeping uh, uh, the story alive. It's not just one investigation that we run. It's like a series of investigation. But uh, until now, we have not uh, yet seen the kind of accountability we would like to see in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alia. Here is uh, one question that has come in, and, and this is uh, something that I was wondering as well. Um, a question for the panel as a whole. Um, what most surprised you when you were reporting this and what recommendations would you have for journalists who want to repeat the same kind of um, of investigation in their own countries i'm not sure who would like to take this first um but uh if uh i can pick somebody is anybody raising their hand to jump in here I can I can take that. Okay, um, sure. 
I, I think it's it's been mentioned before. I, one of the most difficult things in this kind of long term investigation is believing it's going to get somewhere. So, uh, and believing that the, the story is going to be published eventually, uh, and not uh, and and choosing the right angle because so much happens and deciding on what what uh, what angle can be to the most uh, the mo most impact are very important things. Persistence. To, to get and having a strategy ahead of time, knowing why, which angle to follow and why we're following this angle is super important, uh, I think. And uh, uh, it, it really works having a strategy for an investigation, not only in terms of where the story is going, but also what kind of impact it's going to have after publication. Um, a, a question on that, and, and I'll throw this open to the panel again. Here's another question that, that has come in, and that is also to do with the impact that your work has. Um, how, how, what do you see in terms of other countries, um, the media in other countries picking up what you've found, um, and what kinds of media outside your country seem to be um, keyed into um, the findings that you've um, that you've that your investigations have uncovered, and which seem just not to be interested at all. And it looks like you want to answer that question. Uh, what organization can you please repeat? Oh, okay. And I I called on you because I saw your uh, your screen light up there. Um, have uh, media in other countries beyond your own countries um, have other media picked up on the findings on what you found and what kinds of media seem to be interested and what kinds of media seem to just ignore completely your work mm -hmm. yes yes it's clear um we have we've been talking about our media market ukrainian media market so there are uh media which owned by oligarchs uh, by rich people who uh, are businessmen and they uh, have pretty uh, big influence on politicians and on uh, top politicians and officials. Uh, so it's bi the biggest TV channels in Ukraine and media owned by oligarchs. And other small amount of media, uh, it's like independent media, like we are, we mostly um, our budget, our money is from international uh, foundations and there are a few media like we are. So mostly when we share our investigations and our findings, uh, this small independent sector usually share it. But oligarch channels usually don't do, only in cases it's um, according to their business interest, if we publish something against their competitors, business competitors or political competitors, they take it. If not, no. So we have like our small market of independent media and they share it. But sometimes, mostly our findings ignored by oligarch-owned uh, TV channels and other media. Um. Uh, Betty, I'm curious um, if you could uh, just say something from your end in Liberia. I mean, Liberia is a country that depends quite a lot on foreign aid. Um, did the fact that you found legislators who were basically stealing a whole lot of money, um, uh, did it have any kind of impact um, among donor countries? Um, do they take notice of the, this kind of thing? So um, uh, two things I want to say is that the um, sustainability or the independence of media institutions are, are very slim because um, and these lawmakers who um, abscond funds or who interpret and public funds and to their youngs are the ones who are operating media institutions. Right, and with that, you find out that uh, if you want to be an independent journalist, and you either go for, or you just uh, have to fetch for uh, grants abroad, where in you can do your kind of um, investigative journalism. So, um, with your 
in Korea, I would say that um, that um, you yes, um, donor funds are coming in, but where these lawmakers mostly make their money from it's from the national budget. So if if the health um, sector should have 1.5 million, they own um, health institutions. So as a result, those funds that should go for public um, facilities, we have to go for private facilities. Yeah. Um, I have a question myself. Um, and it sort of uh, uh, probably pertains to each one of you, but I, I think to begin with, I'm going to ask it of Maxime. Um, you're, uh, uh, most of you are like touching on, on very sensitive issues um, in your countries. Um, and at what point does it become obvious to the authorities what you're investigating and how do you protect yourself personally as a journalist? Oh, the, <laughs> you know, in Russia, the media zone is called foreign agents. Um, it's uh, literally the legal term. Uh, for now, we, I would like to say we don't face in, we don't face in something, something like jails or we right now i mean right now we are not uh, we are not threatened but uh, uh, the government the officials they create uh, very very a lot of barriers uh, for us to work it's not personal for us uh, just personal for us it's uh, i think it's uh, for the whole uh, for the for all the all independent media in the country and uh, what uh, and about belarus uh, we for now we Evacuated all the all of our uh, editorial office from uh, from the, that country because it is uh, we believe that is uh, not safe. So the Belarus is very very worse for now than Russia. Um, I there is one question that come in about the um, thing that you've learned personally through these investigations. Um, I think um, if we can get Fateh back on the line, and I'm not sure if this is possible, um, Fateh, your investigation um, touched very personally on your own childhood and your own experiences going through the Khalwa system. Um, I'm just wondering how this kind of impacted you as a journalist doing this project. هنالك دافع وليس شخصي ولكن كنت أريد أن أوصل صوت أصوات هؤلاء الأطفال. إلى العالم إلى الأشخاص الموجودين داخل السودان الذين يعتقدون أن الخلاوي هي أماكن آمن للأطفال وأن ليس هنالك أي شيء يحدث لهم وإلى جميع الأشخاص في العالم أن هنالك انتهاكات ممنهجة برعاية الدولة وصمت المجتمع يتعرض له آلاف الأطفال بل الملايين في السودان ولأنهم فقراء لا يستطيعون الذهاب إلى المدارس ولأن أسرهم لا تستطيع أن تقوم بمحاكمة الشيوخ أو أو الذهاب إلى المحكمة ولأنهم يصدقون ما يقوله الشيخ حتى وإذا توفى أحد الأطفال أو مات داخل الخلوة نتيجة لعنف أو ضرب أو اختصاب كل هذه الأسباب ولأن غياب صوت هؤلاء الأطفال في كل وسائل الإعلام المحلية في السودان يتجنبون الحديث عن هذه المؤسسات أو 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 هؤلاء الأطفال، فكان من المهم أن أكون صوت لهؤلاء لهؤلاء الأطفال حتى يتعرف الأشخاص داخل السودان وخارج السودان حتى يكون هنالك تغيير إيجابي لوضعهم نحو الأفضل. Um, and how about um, everyone else? I mean, you are reporting on um, your own countries and. Uh... 
really financial abuse in your own countries. I wonder if I can just go around quickly around the group and get this and ask you the same kind of question. How did it impact you personally, um, what you uncovered um, earlier? Okay, great. So I'm gonna go first. I will just say that um, when I started um, this investigation, one personal lesson I learned was that um, 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 these lawmakers, um, they have very loud, loud mouth. Like um, they speak so loud about accountability. They try to hold um, the, the president and, and others, you know, that they are absconding funds, but then they refuse to hold themselves accountable. They refuse to be um, transparent. And if I had the chance to um, report more, yeah, I'm gonna keep on with that. Um, Alia, what uh, what did you f find? What did, how did you feel personally at the end of all of this? In, in one word, I felt empowered as a journalist. There has been a great value in collaboration that I cannot uh, stress on the fact that we are working with uh, colleagues outside Lebanon not only gave us access to information that otherwise would have been impossible, but it also gave us a sense of immunity. Uh, we live under a lot of pressure as journalists in Lebanon. This fact that we are connected to colleagues and to organizations outside our borders gave us a sense that we're not on our own. And it gave uh, uh, the, the authorities in our country a sense of, of thinking twice before before uh, uh, using the, their usual methods. Yes, we've been uh, summoned to be investigated with and stuff like that, but but this was pretty much it. Uh, it's very frustrating to see that no matter how much you uncover information, very little happens at the level of the uh, of of the direct impact but on the other hand there has been a great response from the audience and a great response from the the the, the people we are playing it's empowering not only for us as journalists but also to, to our audiences so uh it's it's very long work and a lot and a lot of times very frustrating but it pays off really very well and Anna, I imagine it must have been incredibly satisfying to have projected your work on the wall of the Constitutional Court. I thought that was kind of a master stroke on your part. Um, yes, actually, uh, we like to make our serious work sometimes a little bit more understandable for people, closer to people, to, to show that it's about you too, not only like serious offshore things or serious judges corrupted things. So this is one of our methods. But when we are talking about uh, lesson learned from my work and this lesson, uh, repeat um, uh, as much pressure we got in the process of investigation as uh, more important uh, the, the story, the subject we work on. So this is about judges, about police, about, so we see if we got pressure, if we got treats, if people call us, we know that it's really, really very important and we should continue. Of course, we should take all dangers very seriously about uh, journalists I work with, with try to, to keep everything and uh, be careful. But if we get pressure, we understand that it's very important and we continue and we find the way to, to continue and to publish the story in the end. Uh, we have just five minutes before our, what, our uh, Zoom connection cuts out. Um, but I really want to ask you, and especially as we're coming to the end of this incredible conference, what um whether any of you have thoughts about how the global network can um help you in your work um if there are things if you've identified that really could be of great value in terms of collaboration um training specific tools um maxime since we haven't heard from you for a while maybe you could kick off uh, and excuse me, i didn't, didn't got the question ah uh, we're just asking whether or not GIJN 
might be able to help you in your work. And now we have literally three more minutes um, yeah. to wrap up. I got, yeah, I got it. Yeah, uh, uh, I think the JIGN is a beautiful uh, organization, and uh, sometimes we use uh, uh, the JIGN sites to uh, to find some courses or publications. Uh, Sometimes uh, the JJN in Russian have a beautiful Telegram channel, which uh, pro which posts uh, the greatest uh, journalist work with, with uh, always uh, um, which are always great for, <laughs> to to be taken as a reference. And also, uh, just I think you should uh, keep what you're doing. <laughs> well, I think with that. Um... I uh, personally um, wanted to say, say that I use the tools a lot that I've learned um, through these conferences. And um, I want to thank all of you for uh, contributing today. It's been quite something to hear from such a wide range of places and such incredibly varied experience. Um, it's uh, I hope it's been illuminating for all of you. It certainly has been for me. And thank you very much.